our image of Blake Griffin, is that what we see on the court? A man of unparalleled grace and strength. What we've come to learn is that not unlike the rest of us, he's a person with more substance than style. His popular Kia commercials include fictitious images of a younger Blake, but humor, strength, and a childlike innocence has always been at the core of the Los Angeles Clippers' most dynamic athlete. Bingo! This is Blake Griffin yeah. before the big. In New York City in 2009, Blake Griffin's future was announced. Since then, in Los Angeles, he has created a life as large as the Hollywood sign high on the hill above it. Years earlier, that life began in a city found somewhere in between the two coasts. We were teaching both at the same school. He was already there when I took my first job, became friends, and went from there. <laughs> she was helping with the cheerleaders at that time, and so I saw her at the games. First of all, she's beautiful. And I, I no, I take that back. She wasn't beautiful, she is beautiful. And friendship led to other ships, and so therefore, we finally got together later on. Growing up in Oklahoma City, it's, it's slow paced. It's so much different than, than out here. But at the time, I didn't know anything else, so that was how life was. I had a blast growing up in Oklahoma City, and I love, love Oklahoma City. Blake was born to have fun. Had a great, creative mind. Very competitive mind, even from early on. Right after he was born, I was telling everybody about my little, little brother, Blank. Couldn't say his name yet. I was so excited to have a little brother. He was a great big brother. He was really, really protective of him and taught him a lot when he was a little bitty. He was the one that taught him how to ride a bike. They were just great friends. Gail came to me and told me, she said, I'm just not happy leaving the boys at, at daycare. And she said, and once I drop them off, I cry all the way to work and it's just no fun. So at that point, I just said, you know what? If it's not any fun, then you need to quit. I was teaching and, and watching what was going on, you know, in schools, and I thought, I really felt like this is what we needed to do. I feel like the, those years that I was homeschooled, I got a great education because my mom was an actual teacher, and she, you know, she had a curriculum, she had a, a whole schedule and a whole plan, so it was, it, was a, it was a lot of fun. The education part of it was, was cool just because we could get all of our work done. You don't have all, like, the downtime that you have in school. You can get all your work done, be done, by 12 o'clock and be outside the rest of the day. We would be done by noon most days. So my brother and I would be outside, whatever sport we were playing at the time, we'd be doing that. We'd be going to the park, we'd be riding our bikes, we'd just have a blast. And then all our friends from the neighborhood would come home from school and then we'd play all night and then do the same thing every day. Of course, when we started homeschooling, I quit teaching. So our income was cut, you know, right in half. So I was trying to figure out what I could do to make more money. And I'm looking at my shelves, and I had like, oh, 400 trophies or whatever that I had won through the years. But then I thought, well, I'm just going to take one of these apart. And I did, and it didn't look like it was such anything that was very difficult to do. So I said, okay, I'm going to try to go into the uh, trophy business. Yeah, the BNT trophy. I don't remember when I had to start working, but it was, it was young. I might need to check some child labor laws and see, see what they say, but... I didn't really appreciate it and I didn't really like it or enjoy it. And there was times when I couldn't go to my friend's house because I had to be, you know, helping my parents and, and working in the shop and I hated it, but I look back on it today and it, it taught me a lot of lessons. We did like huge orders, like the, the Little League orders, the, the Little Leagues that we played in. So sometimes I made my own trophies. Taylor was uh, really a strong worker. Blake would give us at least five or 10 good minutes and he was off. It was work, but you know, we, we have a lot of like fond memories, especially like the stuff that Blake and I would do together. Also kind of make games of, we would see who can make a trophy the fastest or the quickest. And then now you, you got Blake because it's competition. 
So she could stay home with the boys and bills were still being paid. There's no way in the world I would ever want to change that opportunity that we had to, to be a homeschool family. Coming up next on Blake Griffin Before the Bigs. One of Blake's favorite things was he loved stretching out. He could do the complete splits and backhand the ball. And uh, he was a great first baseman and a good pitcher. Blake has a, a really, really good heart. He's extremely loyal. He's been the exact same friend. He's been my best friend since we were nine years old, and that has never changed. First time I met Blake, third, fourth grade, somewhere in that area, I see Blake at one of my, our older brother's baseball tournaments, and immediately I'm like, wow, he is really big. You know, he's, he's, he's a little different looking than I am. And actually, my mom had left something, something back in our van, which was on like the other side of the baseball complex. And she asked me, and she's like, oh, will you go run and get it? And she's like, well, you know, I'm like eight, nine years old. She didn't really feel safe about me walking all the way back. So she looks around and she grabs Blake. She was like, you should go to the car with him. And I, I guess like she thought I was like older, you know, and I was like, <laughs> I was like gonna help like protect him. <laughs> she has no idea that he's my age, you know, and she's like, hey, would you walk back with him, you know, and kind of watch after him to get the bag? And I'm like, oh my God, no. So we ended up walking back and, you know, that's how we met. From then on, it was just like, we just hit it off. Like we just thought the same, we, we loved the same thing. Sport, it was all about sports for us, so. I think what clicked between me and Blake is we were both really competitive no matter what we were doing. We were so hard on ourselves and I think our competitiveness and our willingness to, to want to get better and to, and to never lose kind of molded us. They both started playing, I think t-ball was their very first sport. Blake was so excited when he, when he joined the White Sox and Josh was a part of that team and so they were good buddies from early on. Blake was our first baseman and our pitcher, and our infielders, uh, it, when you got Blake Griffin as your first baseman, they're, they're pretty confident. They can, <laughs> all they knew is they had to get to the ball and throw it, and uh, he was gonna get to it. You're not gonna throw it over his head, or you're not gonna throw it behind him. He would always overstretch for the ball, and he would do this thing where he'd stretch. That would be out by like five feet. He'd stretch and do the splits. One of Blake's favorite things was he loved stretching out. He could do the complete splits and backhand the ball and uh, he was a great first baseman and a good pitcher. We played in a tournament in Omaha, Nebraska, the Omaha Gladiator Tournament. It was like a big deal for us at the time, and so we all drove up there, and, and one day our, our coach, uh, Coach Winsler, he had the idea to take a picture in the cornfield. Well, we were the White Sox, and of course, you know, Field of Dreams was a big, big deal, and so we decided on the way up that we wanted to get a picture of the kids in the cornfield. We were so pumped about it. That was, that was a picture I'll for sure never forget. We found a nice field that wasn't taller than the kids because we couldn't see them. And then we got that picture. The last year, the, the kids had that framed and, and gave it to me. And I, that, that's, been a, that's been a treasure. It's really nice now when you see what Blake's done. But every one of those kids on there are great kids. I mean, they're just super good, super kids. It was a blast. I, I remember those years. Those years were so fun to me. Coming up next on Blake Griffin Before the Bigs. My dad had the confidence in me to put me in. Um, when it was a close game, from then on out, it was just kind of like, okay, I got this. We had this drink called Barley Green, and it was barley like uh, powder and we would mix it with water and drink it every morning. I don't know how long we took that stuff, but it was like every morning, all four of us took it. I mean, it was nasty. So if some, one of my friends would spend the night and I would have to wake up and do this, they're like, what is that? And I, we would, I would try to get them to try it and they would, none of them, none of them liked it, everybody hated it. But, so I was always considered like the, health, the super healthy one of, of the group. I was like, what is this? Like, where's the pot, you know, where's the candy? But. Obviously, his body is a little different than mine, so he was doing things the right way, even at that age. The barley drink his mother forced upon him may have played a factor in Blake's rapid rise in the sport of basketball, but much of the credit must go to Blake's father. For close to two decades, the biggest Griffin in Oklahoma was Tommy, who began winning state titles before Blake began to dribble. 
I think he was 24 at the time, coaching class in high school. Shouldn't have won, didn't have the best team, but Tommy coached him up and they won the state title. And then over the next 25 years, he became one of the legendary coaches in Oklahoma. In the 90s, he was John Marshall coaching a, a fabulous team, had a bunch of Division I players and really became an iconic coach. It's amazing just to see how many lives he's touched, just constantly being in Oklahoma City and hearing like, hey, your dad coached me. Uh, back in whenever our, we won a state championship with your dad, like it's 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 really cool to see. But um, yeah, even growing up, like you had that sense of like, okay, he's people know him. He's he's a pretty big deal. Anytime I got to go to practice with my dad, it was like the best the best day ever. Just because we would be in the gym with him all day, and we'd be so excited. Wake up early, be there the whole day, be shooting on the side goals. Um, and it was just, I, my brother and I had a blast just being around that whole atmosphere. And then we would go to, we'd go to almost all the games. Our dad did, I think, a really good job of introducing us to every sport out there. He wanted us to play soccer. He wanted us to play baseball. He never stressed basketball. I think that was really cool. He just let us find basketball kind of on our own. I remember talking to Tommy we talked about his boys a little bit, and you could tell that basketball was not the number one thing in his mind when it came to those boys. It was, it was character and discipline and, and doing the right thing. Tommy enjoyed incredible success at John Marshall High School, but began to feel it was time for a change. He moved to a Christian school in the Oklahoma City suburb, a place Gail thought might also be a good fit for her boys. Tommy's first year was, it was great. We'd talk for a couple years about them going to school and did, did you, you know, are you ready? Do you want to, you know, we just talked about different things at home. And when he was there and they were kind of, you know, they kind of warmed up to it and they decided they wanted to. I wasn't sure that OCS was gonna be the place for us. But after that first year, I knew it was gonna be a place for us because it was a really good school. Tommy said, now do my, my boys have to come to school here? It kind of caught me because I thought, well, no, it's not our policy. That year, we came across one of his boys. The oldest boy was Taylor, who was still, wow, that's an amazing looking athletic kid. And I thought, wow, maybe we need to change our policy. Everyone said, you know, Taylor's really good, but the little brother's going to be even better. And Blake came along as a ninth grader and was fantastic, one of the best players this state's ever seen. Blake enjoyed a dream career playing for his father at Oklahoma Christian School. The Saints were 29-0 his freshman season, and the team lost just two games his second year. Freshman year, I didn't play a whole lot. I, I'd played football that year. I came out late. I was towards the end of the bench and worked my way up to being kind of like the sixth man, I guess, towards the end of the year. He started playing more towards the end of the season and played some big minutes in like the state championship game. In the state championship game with like five minutes left in the game, we're actually losing, we're down five. One of my leading scorers at that time had played every minute and you could tell he was starting to get tired. I looked down the bench and, and I'm thinking, who can I play And The answer was Blake. And Coach Griffin puts Blake in, I'm like, you like, you want Blake to go in right now? Like what? So he went in and uh, first thing he did was got a rebound, passed it out, we'd go down and score. I said, all right. Blake goes in and hits two back-to-back -back jump hooks that ties us. That was kind of like his coming out deal. Everyone was like, oh, snaps. Taylor definitely drove Blake and pushed Blake to be better, I think, and it obviously paid off. I didn't know it at the time, but you know, at that moment, I think I got like a little peek of what was to come. That game like meant so much to me because it was a huge game to me in my eyes, and, and my dad had the confidence in me to put me in. Um, when it was a close game, from then on out, it was just kind of like, okay, I got this. As a dad, I'm thinking, wow, does it get any better than this? Because that's something that a lot of dads really don't have opportunity to experience. But as a coach, he was tough on us, and he was tougher on myself and my brother. He explained that very well. He's like, you know, listen, I'm going to be harder on you than I am on everybody else because I expect more out of you guys. Sometimes it was hard to understand, but you know, looking back, I'm, I'm extremely grateful for that because, you know, he pushed me harder than probably any other coach would have. I remember my senior year throwing Blake a lob from half court 
I think it was toward the end of the game, we were up on a team by a lot. And he was telling me, as I was throwing it, he was telling me not to throw it. I remember after the game, I got chewed out for about 10, 15 minutes, it seemed like. He wanted the best for us and wanted us to do play ball the right way. Like I said, I understand that, but it was, it was frustrating at times, for sure. He was like a no-nonsense coach. He didn't want us to do anything um, to try to make it look like we were showboating or anything like that. So he, he was very serious about it, and, and our team was, was very disciplined because of that. You knew he cared about you, and uh, you knew that he really had our best interests at heart. But he could be tough without raising his voice. He could just look you in the eyes and talk to you and reduce you down to size pretty fast. It was intense. Coach Griffin, it was, it was his way or the highway. I mean, he just harped on you like perfection, perfection, perfection. And uh, I mean, it, and later in life now, like it's, it's paid off. I've often heard that I was too hard on the boys. But you can look at the results, and if the results show that you weren't, it's just something that you were trying to do to make them stronger and better, then I think it's all worth it. On the court, Blake Blossom, playing with his older brother and for his father, but also because for the first time he was doing so for school and with classmates who had quickly become his best friends. Wilson was like the big, goofy, outgoing, like he talked to everybody, was constantly laughing. Me and Blake gave him a hard time a lot, and he was just able to take it. Nothing ever affected that kid. I don't think, I never ever saw him in a bad mood, ever. Tucker is just kind of a goon, just the kind of guy in a group of friends that always keeps things interesting, we'll say that. I didn't always have the best ideas, but we all committed to him. Might have stuck us down a couple of roads we didn't want to go every once in a while, but. Justin was like, I called him Deborah because we called him Debbie Downer. Justin was always the one that kind of kept us in line. When I'd be trying to talk some, some sense into them and let them know, hey, this might not be the best idea, that they'd all cry for me. They'd call me Debbie Downer. Uh, they'd say I was like having a, a mom around. And at the time, we would just be like, God, come on, Justin, like, let's, just let us do this, you know? But he, he probably kept us out of a lot of trouble, which is crazy because we got into a lot of trouble. So I don't know where I'd be without Justin today. <laughs> Blake was kind of a class clown a little bit, making everybody laugh. You didn't want to do anything embarrassing around Blake because he'd never let you forget about it. He'd ride you about it pretty good. One of the things that made us as good as we were is that they, these guys were friends. And when you have friends on the team, you look out for each other because they know that's how you get successful. My sophomore year, and that was when my brother had, was pretty, pretty big in the state of Oklahoma. Taylor is a great jumper, strong, could shoot pretty well. He was a little bit more of the leader type. Being the older brother, you'd sort of expect that. He was a little more of the outgoing guy. Taylor's senior year, Blake's sophomore year, we were playing U.S. Grant, which is one of the of Oklahoma City Public Schools. And uh, the very first play, Taylor jumps. He tips it to Blake. Blake pushes it back to Taylor. Taylor dribbles down. He throws it up toward the rim. And I'm thinking, what is he doing? Then the next thing you see is Blake flying through the air, catching me with both hands and just throwing it down. And at that point, even the U.S. Grant, <laughs> started, they started jumping up and laughing and high-fiving, and it was, it was electric. It was electric. It was just, and I'm thinking, I'm trying to be cool here. I'm saying, oh, yeah, that was nice. <laughs> but I mean, inside, I'm jumping up and saying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was just so much fun, though. It was fun just coaching him. He made a huge leap from his freshman year in high school to his sophomore year, which was my senior year. And then I left to go to college and he just kept growing. He got bigger and stronger, more explosive. I was nervous because everybody always said like, once Taylor leaves, we're not gonna be any good. I was Taylor's little brother. So I, I felt like I had something to prove. And everyone was wondering, okay, is Blake gonna be as good as his older brother? And a lot of people doubted him and say, oh, you know, he'll, he'll never be as good as Taylor. And that year, he kind of started to move out of Taylor's shadow. And instead of being Taylor Griffin's little brother, it was, oh, hey, there's Blake Griffin. Going into my junior year, you know, playing AAU that summer, that's when I really, like, started to kind of come into my own. Blake really got into AAU with Athletes First that year. I hadn't seen him in, like, three weeks, I want to say. And he gets out of the car, I was like, whoa. I mean, I'm talking like he was muscle toned up. He grew, like, three inches, I swear. Like, I didn't even recognize him almost. And I was like, yikes. 
I guess I looked different. I didn't, I didn't really notice it. Blake really started dominating the circuit. And he was just a beast. I mean, he was just a beast. And I couldn't believe the progress between the year that I had him and the year that I saw him after I left. And he was, he was unbelievable. When Taylor left for college, Blake picked up the slack, averaging 21 points and 12 rebounds. The team finished 26 and three and won its third consecutive state title. His numbers increased to 27 points and 15 rebounds as a senior at OCS. Blake comes into his senior year. We're wondering, I wonder how good Blake's gonna be. Now, we, we watched high school basketball where you know you dribble, you come, you come, you lay it in, or maybe you get you gather your steps and then you you get a dunk. We're sitting up here having paid four dollars to go see a high school basketball game, and we see something that's no one's seen. And I made the comment several times. I said, you know, you didn't pay enough to watch what you're getting ready to see tonight. In his final high school game, Blake tallied 22 points in the team's 31-point blowout in the state championship. Blake's assist was like 4.8 4 his senior year. So that's pretty good for a guy that's in the post. I mean, he's looking for his other his teammates. Same thing with uh, Tucker. Same thing with uh, Wilson. And uh, Justin didn't play as much, but he was a really important factor of our team because everybody loved Justin. And Justin was just that kind of guy. You, everybody needs to have a Justin in their life. Coming up next on Blake Griffin before the bigs. I told him, I said, you need to change your goals. Like your vision is not big enough. I think you could be one of the best power forwards to ever play this game. It is crazy, the number one pick in the 09 NBA draft, the number one pick in the 2010 NFL draft, grew up about four, three, four miles apart in Northwest Oklahoma City. I remember him coming to me and be like, hey, do you just want a carpool? <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, sure. So we would like get in the car and just like talk about whatever. We would do like impersonations of teammates um, and just crack jokes the whole time. The thing I remember most is those car rides and his impersonations. And he is absolutely hilarious. He's probably one of the funniest guys that I've ever met. And it was so much fun getting to do that. One thing I always remember after practice, we stopped at this gas station and got a Snickers ice cream bar and a Gatorade. And the guy like undercharged us for it the first time. So every time we went back, he was just like, ah, whatever, it's a dollar. And we were so psyched about saving like $2 on, on a ice cream bar and, and a Gatorade. Coaching Sam and Blake was, I mean, I couldn't believe, I was like, wow, now these guys are pro NFL and, and NBA and Sam ended up winning the Heisman Trophy. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine I ever being in a position to coach those guys. Oklahoma's got a proud athletic tradition, but I don't know that we ever thought we'd be uh, churning out the number one overall picks on an assembly line. Bradford, who's a year older than Blake, chose to stay home and play football at the University of Oklahoma. But for much of Sooner Nation, basketball's little more than a diversion in the spring that is until football season begins. Blake had offers from most every top-notch collegiate basketball power in the country, making his choice a little more difficult. He had narrowed it down to five schools. And at that point, I am not going to push him either way. I don't want to be the fact that you, okay, you go to, let's say, school X. You go to school X and it's because I kept pushing you there. You get there and you're unhappy. I don't want that situation. Blake and his mom and dad came over uh, shortly after I was hired just to meet me. And then the very next weekend is when I saw him play the first time. And I was blown away. I was blown away at the athleticism, the size, with how hard he played, how physical he was. And I knew right then, okay, this is the guy we have to get him. And Taylor comes and he sits with me. And he says to me, he says, you know, coach, you know, I wondered, like, how much do we really want Blake? I said, I want him I'm in every game. That's, that's the guy. He was like, well, you don't really ask me about him. I'm just curious about that. And I said, well, I need to develop a relationship with you. I don't want you thinking I'm trying to do that just because of Blake. And then he says to me, he's like, well, you know, just so you know, I was at home having dinner with my family the other day. And I told Blake, 
if you want to come to OU now, like you should do it. Like I believe in this coach and what we're doing. I really had every intention to take all my visits and, and really go through the process and something just, just felt right. And I remember Taylor came home one night and we were sitting there eating dinner and he was talking about all the stuff they were doing. And he was like, you know, I think this, this would be a good place. If, this, if that's where you want to go, this would be a good place for you. I told him why I thought OU would be good, why I thought Coach Capel would be a good coach, and what the benefits I, I thought of, of staying close to home and, and playing in your home state. I think the draw really for OU, for Blake, was because Taylor was there, and he wanted to continue to play with Taylor. I think he agreed that it would be a lot of fun to play together again and you know go through that experience. And I was just sitting there in Coach Cable's office, and we were watching a, a basketball game. I text my brother and my mom and my dad, and I was like, I want to, I want to commit. So I was excited. Both boys were going to be at Oklahoma, <laughs> 35 minutes away from our driveway. <laughs> the fact that I could stay close to home, my parents could go see both of us play at the same time, you know, it was a huge plus. Um, but it also had a lot to do with uh, my relationship with Coach Cable. I remember asking him, like, what are your goals with, with basketball? Like, what do you want to accomplish? And I remember he talked about he wanted to be a McDonald's All-American. He wanted to be able to pick where he wanted to go to college. You know, he wanted to have a chance to start immediately. He would like to win a national championship. And I told him, I said, you need to change your goals. Like, your vision is not big enough. I think you could be one of the best power forwards to ever play this game. That was my school. That was the guy that I believed in. I knew he believed in me. And, and you know, that was, that was one of the best decisions I made. He was excited. And with him, it was about changing, helping me change the culture there. Change it by how you work, how you act, how you play. And that was like something I really took to heart. That culture was shaken dramatically from the moment Blake took the floor as a freshman. He scored in double digits in 14 of his first 16 games, including a season high 27 against K-State on January the 12th. But two days later, in a big matchup versus Kansas, Blake's resolve was tested for the first time. It was the first four minutes of the game, and there was like a, a loose ball right in front of our bench. And Blake went up to get it, and he landed awkwardly. And he landed, and he went down, and he was holding his knee. And I knew immediately there was something serious. He uh, sprained his knee and uh, had a medial collateral ligament sprain. Most people are out four weeks. Blake was out 12 days. Later that season, had a torn cartilage in his knee, and did that on a Saturday afternoon, and on Sunday morning he had surgery, and by Wednesday afternoon that week he was asking to play in the game at Oklahoma State. We play at Oklahoma State on Wednesday, so he can't play in Bedlam, uh, which is a huge deal, period, but especially for an Oklahoma kid. But he plays that Saturday. He plays three days later, and I think he had a double-double against Missouri. <laughs> It's freaking nature, man. It's, 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 it's a freaking nature. Blake was kind of like Superman. He went through the uh, training room and, and just changed clothes. And out he came uh, as from Clark Kent to Superman. The Sooners finished 23-12, and 12, fourth in the Big 12 Conference in Blake's freshman season. He averaged 15 points and nine rebounds and was a first-team all-conference selection. NBA scouts were drooling, thinking about what their team could be with him on it. But Blake, seeing the future, liked what he saw right in front of him. He came up to the office one day and told me he was going to stay. And I said, are you sure this is what you want? And he said, yeah. And, I, and he said, what do you think? I said, well, I think physically you're ready. But my opinion is that if you're a high draft pick, you're going to be looked at to be the face of a franchise and or a city. I think another year of college will help prepare you for that because you will be the face of college basketball next year. I felt like I could have made the jump, but I felt like I could be more prepared. And, and I wanted the challenge of, of coming back, trying to go number one, trying to win a national championship. But I also think a big part of it was that he wanted to be there with Taylor. I think that was a big part. It was Taylor's senior year, and I think he wanted to be there with Taylor and to experience that with him. My senior year, his sophomore year, we were really good that year. And looking back on it, it was, it was a blast. I don't think he would have come back without Taylor. Blake realized that I'm going to go to the NBA, I'm going to have all kinds of opportunities, but the chance to play with my brother one more year with my parents just down the road where they can come to all our games, 
uh, that chance is not going to come uh, this way again. Going into the Texas game, we were 25 and one. And if we win that game, we're number one in the country. Then we get the concussion and we ended up losing that game by like four points. I remember after it happened, looking over at Blake on the bench. <laughs> he just like looked like a little kid, like, like the look I'd seen him have like for so long ago, like when he was a little kid, just like sitting there, just kind of like looking around, just like I, I knew he was out of it immediately. Be honest, like I, to this day, I don't, I don't know what it was like people were saying it was like on a screen when I, I got hit with an elbow but like I just remember like running down the, up and down the court and I like didn't feel I felt like weird and I came to the bench and my trainer was like are you okay like blah 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 I was like yeah I think I'm okay and then we did like some tests in the back at halftime and, and they didn't let me go back in so that was it was like devastating <laughs> it was very devastating he had to deal a lot with teams trying to get in his head and cheap shot him and guys kicking him guys grabbing them, guys doing whatever they could, basically. He got beat up every game. I mean, teams just tried to be physical, took cheap shots, but he was always able to maintain his composure. They want to get you mad enough to get you out of the game, and if you're out of the game, they have a chance to win. So you have to learn how to take these things, and he's taking it to heart. In spite of the physical beating he took, Blake tore up the competition as a sophomore. He averaged 23 points and 14 rebounds a game. The Sooners won 25 of their first 26 games. Lloyd Noble Center came alive in the early months of 2009 as football crazed Sooner Nation ignited the arena with a passion once reserved only for football. The team would be rewarded with a two seed that March. The first round against Morgan State, the, uh, you know, Blake gets, uh, sort of upended and gets uh, lands on his head. Big famous play in which he's, he jumps up, somebody comes under him. The next thing we knew, he was being flipped over the guy's back. And the next thing I knew, I'm seeing Taylor sprint from where he was down to, to Blake. And I'm just glad, glad the guy that did the flipping got out of the way. Because I don't think I've seen Taylor react like that. I don't think I've ever seen Taylor react like that. He gets up, finishes the game, of course they win, and the next round blow out Michigan, and so on to the Sweet 16 they go, and go to Memphis and play Syracuse. Tony Crocker, I think he scored 25 points, sank a bunch of three-pointers, just shot Syracuse completely out of that zone, blew out the Orangemen, and Blake was on to the Elite Eight, where they played North Carolina, which was one of the great teams of recent NCAA history. And the Sooners went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, but no one was gonna beat North Carolina. Certainly uh, one of the three or four best OU teams of all time. And that Sooner team got about uh, all it could out of what it had. That was like a run that I'll never forget. And it was probably some of the most fun I've had playing basketball. Coming up next on Blake Griffin before the bigs. It's just like, whoa, that's, man, we played one-on-one -on -one the last 10 years. And now he's going to go on to be the rookie of the year, multiple time all-star, you know? So it was, uh, it was crazy. And that means the number one pick in the 2009 NBA draft will be made by the Los Angeles Clippers. I just got the second pick. That was kind of it. I remember looking at my agent who lives here in LA and, and I, mean, I was like, I guess I'm moving in with you, you know, and, and that was it. I didn't really, it hadn't really hit me, you know, the, the whole LA thing until I really got out here. Five weeks after that life altering moment, Blake Taylor and an entourage of Oklahoma friends and family made their way to New York. I always said I was going to do and always wanted to do was, was you know, take my, my friends, you know, to the draft, you know, have them be a, be a part of this day with me. And Wilson, Josh, and Justin were all there. I was a little frustrated because I couldn't really hang out with them as much as I wanted to. We had to go to so many different things, but having them there for that week, the couple of days that they were there, and then that night, it was a blast. It was really cool to be there to experience it and surreal at the same time. Well, it's a special occasion for, for any family, especially being this, this uh, atmosphere. It was just like, whoa, that's, man, we played one-on-one -on -one for the last 10 years, and now he's going to go on to be the rookie of the year, multiple-time all-star, you know, so it was, uh, it was crazy, I think, the best way to describe it.
surreal, actually. Really, really proud. Lots of fun. Really exciting. I can't imagine what was going through Coach Griffin's mind. I mean, this is this is your son. This is your boy. This is the like the kid who you taught the game to. And to see he's the number one pick in the draft. With the first pick in the 2009 NBA draft, the Los Angeles Clippers select Blake Griffin. I'm just so happy and excited for Blake because I, I know all the work that he put into it. When Taylor got drafted, everybody was really excited and you could tell Blake was almost more excited and more happy about Taylor getting drafted than he was himself. Blake is Taylor's biggest fan. When we were there for draft night, the happiest that Blake was was when Taylor was drafted. Our agent called me and said that the Suns wanted me at 48 and asked if I wanted to go up on stage and like actually uh, shake hands and all that. But I mean, honestly, like everybody was right there in that room. So I ended up just staying and like, you know, we celebrated right there and it was, it was perfect. It was a night the Griffin family will always remember, made that much more special because they were able to experience it with friends from home. One of them on hand that night was Wilson Holloway, who was diagnosed with cancer back in 2008. I think the most exciting thing for Wilson was that uh, Blake allowed him, uh, flew him out for the draft. And Wilson was, had just finished a really uh, grueling round of, of treatment, and we really didn't think that he should go. Um, but he asked his doctor, and his doctor gave him a release to go, and Blake flew him out there, and they had a wonderful, wonderful time. I think that's one of the things that just kind of kept him going and got him through that treatment, because he knew he wanted to go to the draft. He was just having the time of his life. I'm really happy that uh, Blake actually got to fly him out there for that, because that was one of his highlights, for sure. You don't expect for one of your best friends to have cancer. So when he first got it, I was... I was surprised and concerned, but after talking to Wilson about it, he made it seem like it wasn't really a big deal. It was hard because Wilson wouldn't tell them. He just, you know, he'd just go on and, you know, he said, oh, I'm doing fine. You know, things are, things are good. And I really didn't catch on to how serious it was for Wilson either until I talked to his mom. But he didn't want to let on to his friends that, you know, you need to worry about me. That's just what in Wilson's nature. So Blake really didn't realize even how bad he was at the very end, because he was so far away. Coming up next on Blake Griffin before the bids. Uh, I just remember her going, like saying, I'm sorry, you know? And uh, I like lost it. Blake's rookie campaign with the Clippers was delayed by a year. And Griffin was hobbling after that time. In the team's final preseason game on October 23rd, he broke his kneecap, forcing season-ending surgery. His return in the fall of 2010 was highly anticipated, and he didn't disappoint. Blake scored 20 points and hauled in 14 rebounds in the season opener. Against the Knicks, he poured in 44. Then topped that versus Indiana in January when he made 19 of 37 field goals, finishing with 47 points. His injury from a year ago was in the rearview mirror. He was voted into the All-Star game and everything seemed to be going as planned. But those plans changed when news of Blake's sick friend, Wilson, reached him in Minnesota. I'll never forget like when it really, really got bad, like a couple days before. Um, he actually passed away. I remember his, his girlfriend at the time called me. He was like, Wilson's not doing too great. We got to take him in. We were in Minnesota at the end of like a very long road trip. We won that game that night. And I remember doing the post game interview on the court. I remember going like, just getting like a bad feeling as I'm like walking off after the interview was over. And so I walk in the locker room, we do our post game meeting with a uh, coach and, and then I tell him, uh, our equipment manager, like, yo, I need my phone, I need it, I need my phone. So he grabs it, gives it to me, and I have like 
<clears throat> missed call, missed call, missed call, all from like Justin, my mom, you know, like certain people. My mom calls me back and uh, <clears throat> I just remember her going, like saying, I'm sorry, you know, and uh, I like lost it. That was like the first time anything, like anybody that close, like that, that was the first time it ever happened. So I didn't really, I didn't know how to, how to react. To be able to help him through it was, you know, I, it made me really, really, really sad. Cause he was too far away. I couldn't, I couldn't be there and be there for him. I know it was, it was really tough on Blake and, um, you know, honestly, I, I didn't really know how to talk about, like we, neither of us really knew how to talk about it at the time. And so it was, it was, uh, it was really hard. He called me the next morning and just sounded terrible. And he's like, man, so you want me to come home now? That's all I kept talking about was coming home. He's pretty torn up about it. When you talk about family, you know, you're usually talking about blood relationships, but, um, they weren't blood related, but was just very, very close to each other to where they could be genuine with each other. Just a genuine bond. It's understandable why it would be hard on Blake. Blake knows we lost a good guy. Not right, but then again, this whole world is kind of off, off tilt, isn't it? We knew that we wanted Blake to be there at the services. And so we, you know, purposely scheduled the services so that Blake could be there. I just, you know, gave him a hug and told him I appreciated him being there and that I knew that, you know, it was very difficult for him. But I often wonder, you know, if he really was given the proper, you know, time to grieve because um, he couldn't do it privately. He had to do it out, you know, um, in the public. Wilson, you could take that kid in their room, and even if you have him the worst day of your life, he'd make you feel better. That was that was his M.O., and I mean, he's he was one of the most genuine guys I knew. Not too many people can have a friend like Wilson. Three days after Wilson's passing, an emotional Griffin returned to the Staples Center floor to compete in the slam dunk contest. By dedicating the win to Wilson, Blake began the healing process. Uh, I want to dedicate, you know, this to my friend, uh, my best friend who passed away this past Wednesday. Um, I know he would have been watching me here, so, you know, I dedicate this to him, and I hope I made him proud. I mean, it was like something that was kind of like, it was, it's like the least I can do. You know, I, I didn't really know what else to, didn't know what else to do, what else, how else to, like, approach that. That was, you know, that was, that was one thing I, I wanted to do, and I was thankful for the opportunity to do that. He would go on to win the Rookie of the Year award that year, and in season since, he's helped transform the Clippers into one of the elite franchises in all of the NBA. Living in the shadows of Hollywood has also afforded Griffin an opportunity to explore creative ways to share his unique sense of humor, something which was born and bred back in Oklahoma. Blake was born to have fun. People don't realize how much of a uh, sense of humor Blake has uh, and a very wry sense of humor. We would play ping pong all the time. And at first I was beating him. You know, I would, I would beat him pretty easily. Then he got, I mean, he just got better. You know, he just, he caught on he, and he started beating me kind of on the regular and I would get really upset, you know. So, like, I wouldn't talk to him for like 20 minutes after the game and all of a sudden, you know, he'd be like, Hey, Josh. And I'd be like, what? You know, thinking he had something to ask. He'd be like, hey, do you remember when I just kicked your butt in ping pong or something like that? You know, just like that dry humor, a um, little bit of a jerk sometimes, you know, type of thing. He's, he's really funny and good at that. So come on down for great deals on premiums. I'll tell you what, though. I really do like this gear. Like you really meant that. You're turned off. Of course. Why wouldn't I mean that? I, mean, the... I also love Lithuania, sponsored by Lithuania Tourism. What you see on those commercials is Blake. Blake is really smart, and he's got a good sense of humor. Who are you? I'm you from the future. You should be playing that game. But all you do is dunk in that game. Bingo! What else can you tell me? Practice your free throws. A lot. Wrong sport. Any advice? Keep lifting and you'll look like this. 
Yeah. No, I know. I just love comedy and I love watching funny things and, and I would rather do something that was funny than it was all like serious and you know really like hardcore like that. What's crazier than dunking over a key optima? Having it dunk over me. I'm not the only thing that hurts worse than that optima? What's that? Your words. Maybe you need to hit bottom so you can get back up. I did hit the bottom of the optima. So I think I know a little bit about hitting rock bottom. I'm not a good actor, so I'm not gonna try to like, you know, go out of my range and, and try to like do all these funny things. I just kind of try to be myself in them and, and put, I guess, my touch on them. What's my future like? It's bright. Very bright. We look back at pictures when they were little and, and think about, you know, memories and who would have ever guessed at that point when we first started a little, you know, t-ball games when they were six, that we would be where we are today.